All right. Good morning. Today's an early one for us. Uh, what is today? January 10th. Um, and we have Sierra from Sun Peak Official back. And today I made her pick a topic because she keeps getting upset because I just keep winging it and not giving her bullet points to <laughs> come prepared. So today is her chance to pick a topic. So welcome back, Sierra. Thanks for having me back. And I tried to <laughs> wait as long as possible to give you the topic so you could be as unprepared. As I yes, I know you couldn't too. That's why it came at a decent time. Still, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still, I still gave it thought. And <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. What do we got going today? So I thought we could talk about kind of worst money advice um, that you've been given or that you've uh, heard thrown around, and then maybe some bad money habits that can keep people poor oh the well i don't know worst is such a you know hard way to describe it. i think for me the i guess the biggest thing would be kind of kind of following what everyone else is doing so i don't know if it's so much of an advice but it's kind of so like in the firehouse you see um, you know, your captains, you know, they've probably been in the department, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of you. So you see what they're kind of doing to prepare for retirement. So I think for me, that's maybe some of the, I guess you could say worst advice that I got is kind of just following this path that other people are doing ahead of me, not really paying attention too much that maybe my situation is different. I may have different goals. But just kind of going along this path that they've set for me, and and I think that is it's somewhat of, somewhat of a trap. But I would say that was kind of one of kind of the worst advice, I guess you could say, that I got. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, we kind of talked about um, how blanket advice or advice that's one size fits all um, is typically <sighs> bad advice because when it comes to finances, like it is very personal and and situational and it uh, behavioral like it all really depends on so many factors so um i i've complained about this before but the kind of gurus out there on social media make these big generalized statements and so i've always kind of um felt like that was a pet peeve of mine is to like read these big blanket statements for financial advice when there's so many exceptions to all of those things so yeah i would say that's definitely what I feel is bad advice for sure. But I think in a way, like you're talking about all these, you know, big social media influencers or gurus that I guess you kind of got to pick a certain talking point, right? Like you can't like, you know, like you're saying money is so fluid and everyone's situation is different that if not, you know, you don't, you, you're not going to have this specific target audience, I guess. I guess in some ways, you know, a lot of these gurus, that's, that's why they pick a niche, right? That's their, that's their target audience. That's kind of what they're going to focus on and that's what works for them. So uh, I guess that's one way you have to look at it. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's great for engagement to, you know, you have your like initial hype crew that's like on board with everything you're saying. And then you have like the people who give it, you know, a couple minutes of thought and then they start to give you pushback. And then it's really great for, you know, getting a lot of comments and a lot of, you know, back and forth on, on these things that like at first at face value, they seem like, oh yeah, that's good. Like, um, that makes a lot of sense. And then you're like, but wait, here's all of these scenarios where that would not work out well. So, um, yeah, I think as a social media strategy, what they do is awesome. Yeah. Now, a tricky one for me, though, is I don't know if it would really be good or bad advice. It's, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on it. So, like, living below your means. Like, I, I, I see it both ways, in a sense. Like, you want to budget, you want to live below your means, but at the same time, part of me feels like there's an abundance of money out there. So it's kind of like, you know, that scarcity and abundancy mindset. So, you know, living below your means is important. However, mm -hmm. should you be striving to, I guess, increase your income in a way? So I don't know if those kind of overlapped each other. Yeah, and, I, yeah. I have... Or I have that same thought where it's it's almost worse advice to be told to like save your money instead of like 
go generate more. Yeah. So that, that's why that's what I'm kind of torn on. I don't know. I guess it's like, you, like you're saying, it's where you're at in your journey or where you're at in life. Right. So I guess, you know, of course, in the beginning, you do want to live below your means. You want to like, like Michael Zuber talks about discretionary income and whatnot. So it is important to, to live below your means in the beginning to make sure you have extra income to invest or grow and whatnot. Um, but at the same time, you also want to always be thinking about how you can increase this income or increase, generate more money. So that's one that if you don't want to get too caught up going down one way, I think though, that's the one thing. Yeah. Agreed. I think the worst, if I'm thinking about my specific situation, the worst advice I've ever been given would have been to probably not buy a house when we were in college and not, not for any financial reasons, but mostly because people are like, well, you're, you know, you're in school, like you're probably going to move afterwards. Like you don't know where your career is going to go um, or what job you're going to get. So like, you're just going to have to sell in a couple of years. Um, and, and I understand, like, I, I hear this excuse a lot as to why people rent is because they want this flexibility to be able to move. Um, and I actually think that's really interesting because it's kind of like one of the best ways to build wealth is to buy a house and move intentionally every couple of years and, um, you know, build up your portfolio that way. And so, I just think it's interesting that people use that as an excuse to to not buy or to you know stay renters because um it's it's assuming that your house would not sell whenever you wanted to move and it's assuming that um you know I guess that you wouldn't want to keep it as a rental either so or that you wouldn't want to build a portfolio that way so anyways I just think that would have like if we had listened to that that would have been um that would have been a bummer because we wouldn't have uh, got all the equity out of the house that we ended up buying initially. And, and yeah, and it, and, you know, it had no, no problem selling whenever it was time to move. So that really didn't affect anything at all. I think that you have to maybe be a little more careful if you have moving in mind that you're buying right in something that is a little more unique or, or isn't a cookie cutter situation where you're going to have a lot of competition um, as far as houses selling, that might make it sit on the market for a long time. But I think generally, if you have that in mind that I'm going to move and this is, this is needs to sell in a couple of years that you just, you know, buy something that's going to be in demand. Yeah, totally agree. I think you just giving me now my best advice is, is have a plan. Like I think <laughs> that's, that's, and I'm just thinking about what you're saying, listening to what you're saying. I think that's where a lot of mistakes, if you don't really have a plan in place, and it, it's hard, you know, you know, you get out of high school and, you know, you go to college and you're kind of worried about getting your degree maybe and getting a job and you're not really planning your future so much. And I think that's actually super important. And I, yeah, I had no clue what my, my vision was and what my goals were. And I think that's, you know, you kind of just get caught up in the rat race and you start going down this path. And even like you're saying, buying a home, not having a plan for it, right? You're just like, oh, what? you know, I like this area. I want to live here. And, and you don't really have a plan on what your next step might be. And like you're saying, like, you know, your plan might be to move or it might be to sell in two years. So that's going to help your decision on what type of property you might buy or not extend yourself. It's not going to be your dream home, maybe your first purchase, but just having some plans. I think that's actually super um, important. And one of the best advice you can get is just having some sort of plan on what your next steps are going to be. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And educating yourself on what the options are just so that you know your exit strategies or you know, you know, even if it's kind of interesting, like you're saying, you get caught up in the rat race because when it comes to graduating from high school, like the only thing anyone's talking about is, you know, where are you going to go to college? What you're, what are you going to major in? And no one's talking about like, well, what's your living situation going to be? Like, are you going to get a house and get roommates and like, um, you know, keep your living expenses low that way. Are you going to live in a dorm? Is that, do you have a, you know, scholarship for that? Like, there's not really a lot of talk over your options when it comes to that, when, when that's really one of the ways to stay ahead financially is, you know, um, is just thinking about what you could do and could, could you buy a house and are you prepared for that by the time you, um, get to college? 
Yeah, I yeah, I like I said, I've wasted like twenty years. So at least like you, I think had a better vision. You know, you you did purchase a home earlier than I did, and you had some sort of plan. I think in place. I mean, yeah, you, you said you you wish you'd do things a little bit differently, you know, by selling it. But uh, yeah, for me, like I I just bought something. Like, yeah, I'm going. You know, this is gonna. I'm I'm comfortable and got super complacent. I wasn't really continuing educating myself so that goes back to what you're saying this education and constantly learning and you know kind of goes back to like we said too it's depends at what what point of life you're in and that's all about learning right you're, you're, things are always changing and even money like how it's being used and what type of tool it is and you know so and how much value it has right so yeah. you know so I think that's always super important is moving forward and not getting complacent in where you're at so what are some money habits that you think keep people from, I, w- I want to say keep, not necessarily keep them poor, but keep them from breaking out of the, you know, the rat race or being able to get ahead or save up for something that they're wanting? Well, I think for me, and I don't hear too many people talking about it, so maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong on it, but <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, too many people get caught up with their credit score. And, and I know, you know, you want to have a good credit score. And I think that's, uh, you know, great number to determine how you are with your money. But I think sometimes it's misleading in a sense, because you can have a great credit score and actually not be good with money in a sense where, you know, you're not trying to acquire asset. You're not spending your money properly, buying things that are going to increase your value because you're not using your credit because you're worried about keeping it at, you know, a certain level or you're trying to get an 800 credit score. But sometimes that just means you're not actually using credit, right? You may have this credit score, but it's not that you're actually acquiring things or using your credit to increase your wealth. So I think like for me, I don't know if I'll ever have an 800 credit score. And I think that's more because I'm constantly using my credit to buy assets now. I mean, before, of course, before I was buying wasteful things, but but now it's like I'm using my credit to take advantage of it and use it to buy things that can increase wealth or increase cash flow. So there's times where my credit score goes down, and, and that's because I'm buying things to to help with generate wealth, and then it goes up. You know, it comes down, but that just means you're using your credit. So I think that's something that. Um, I think people get caught up too much is, is worrying about where their credit score is at. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then it's a great strategy to, you know, if you're going to, you know, get some really high credit score in order to get the best rate possible on an asset, but then like you're, you still need to use it for yeah. that and then let it fluctuate. And um, I mean, unless you're just acquiring consistently all the time than it, you know, you have time to build it back up and Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I was going to say one, sorry, one, one thing I see a lot of people do is buy really trendy items. So I would just like take a, take stock of how many trendy items, you know, do you have a Stanley cup um, with a handle, you know, and do you have a Nalgene cup and do you have, you know, how many, how many of the trends, um, do you follow and spend on in order to kind of keep up with like, what's cool. And I think that's one of the, one thing that a lot of people get sucked into and they don't even realize it's a habit. They just think like, oh, this is something I need in the moment. Um, because Mark, you know, marketing has done a really good job of telling them that they need that. And I think, yeah, Trend, if you shop trends, um, that's a that's a money habit that can keep you from really breaking out and and focusing on wealth. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even realize it, right? Like you're just like, oh, I'm gonna buy this. It's only whatever, ten dollars. And you don't and it just adds up after a while, right? So I think like you're saying, whatever is trendy and marketing is great nowadays, right? It's, it's like you, you know. Hey, checking out anywhere, you know, you're buying food, you know, buying your dinner and then there's like these stuff at the the register. Oh, I'll pick up this or I'll pick up that. And then you don't realize that it just adds up after a while. So, yeah, I think that's, and I've, like I said, I've, my, I got, I've, I've talked about it before, like those damn exercise equipment people <laughs> that it's like, I don't, 
you know, I don't need how many different weight bars and weight plates and, but it got me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And then the, and the bad thing is the resale value is not, oh, not yeah. to say once you buy it, it's like, damn. Yeah. So that's, that, I, that came to mind because we've been going through a lot of our older things and trying to, you know, test out reselling and, and seeing how that would go. And there's definitely, I can, I can almost tell like the stage of life when I decided to stop buying things like on a impulse buy. And, but then I have all of this stuff from before then, then I'm like, man, I use these things maybe one or two times yeah. and they're nearly new. Like we can obviously sell them, but yeah, uh, definitely. It definitely got me for a long time. And I guess I made a shift at some point and decided I didn't need those things anymore, but well, yeah. any other, any other habits you can think of or, um, traps that people fall into that mm, i think the last thing i want to touch on like and I, you know i think it's just goes you know i think everyone talks about it's kind of the get rich quick schemes you know i think that's and i've said i've <laughs> I've, I've probably joined a lot of things earlier in my days too that you know people would laugh at me now but but yeah i think just getting caught up in that and you know, it, it's it's a journey. You know, it's it's not an overnight thing, and I, I don't think anybody would say that they've had success overnight. And you know, people probably don't talk a lot about their failures and whatnot. But I think that's part of it is just realizing that it is a journey, and and don't get caught up in these get rich overnight kind of schemes. And um, you know, you just got to do the work. Yeah, it's a it's a long play. And it's kind of like, you know, time in the market is better than timing the market. And it's like time, um, you know, at whatever pursuit you're you're doing, um, the longer you're in it, the more the competition fades away and you kind of start to stand out. And it really is just um, a long play. Yeah, I think, you know, the also the struggle is where we're at in society where there's always something new, someone's selling something. So it's easy to to quit or change course quickly and you know there's good and bad I, I guess you know sometimes yeah you want to try different things to find your path and or find your community but at the same time a lot of people may not they might be right there right they might be right at the point to to taking off and it's like they're not having that they don't see that success right away and they jump to something else because there's so many different mm -hmm. opportunities out there so I think you know that's the struggle too at, at where we're at in life where it's kind of there's so many opportunities so many, you know, chances to to see different ways to make money and be successful. And it's sometimes it's like you just gotta stay that course a little bit longer and you might be right there. So that that's the struggle too. And we're we're bombarded with courses and coaches who can um, you know, promise to replicate their success. And I being on social media now long enough and um, kind of in this in this world of side hustles um it's been interesting to see a few people that i follow um kind of working towards you know growing their platform and it's it's almost almost instant they get a little bit of success or traction and then they're almost immediately offering a course on how to get that momentum or traction and i'm like you just you just hit like this one thing, you know, and I, I don't know that everyone is going to be able to replicate that. And you've been at it at a, a while. Like, I don't think one tool, um, like it's, you know, unless you're preaching that it is like a, a longevity thing and that you've been working this up and networking this whole time. Like, I don't think your downloadable PDF is really going to help people get the, that success that you just got like a week ago. And now you have a course. So it is interesting and you have to be careful about, um, you know, vetting out who is who is teaching you this information so yeah it's it's hard to get, not fall into those traps yeah i mean i you know i don't know i don't want to say i mean i th honestly i think the majority of the people though that are selling something i, I don't know i think they're genuine it, it, you know and they're, of course you know they're trying to make money but i think it's more just a mindset like if someone join someone's course or take someone's course i think it's just you know i don't know i don't really know who's selling anything different really per se i think it's just finding that tribe and you know you now that you've committed this money to this person's course now you're you're kind of like taking action 
So I think really that's just what it is. It's just connecting with different people and finding your tribe. And cause I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know who's selling something that's too radical out there. You know, everyone has their little niches and whatnot, but it's like, they're kind of just selling the same thing. And it's more just a mindset thing and finding people that you connect with and, yeah. And just like you said, you know, I think sometimes you just spend the money. So it's actually, it, it motivates you to do something, right? You're taking action. I think that's what some people need is just that little push. And yeah, that's all they need. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, um, I can understand that for sure. I think in my mind, I just, I think you have to be very careful who you're trusting to um, steer you. And if they really do have your best interest at heart and wanting yeah. to succeed, or if they're trying to, you know, grow their own business by yeah. selling something. And I think there's a big difference there because when it comes to being a good, um, you know, teacher that takes a that takes a different um heart behind it than trying to grow a business and so yeah. when you're paying someone for their information i would just make sure that they do want to see you succeed and that they have that behind what they're doing yeah of course well this is great you know had time to prepare you gave me a chance to study up a little bit and be ready for this so yeah i'll try to do that to give you a little more time next time <laughs> one more hour <laughs> no i didn't i did send you the topics for the live last night <laughs> <laughs> yeah 10 p.m my time <laughs> well, so I, I, I i literally glanced at them and i was like okay um i'll think about those in the morning <laughs> yeah that's what it was for it says that when you as soon as you wake up you can start thinking about it perfect <laughs> yeah i got on well i got onto youtube to see your the scheduled live to see what you put in the description and what you put as the title so i could have a little more context <laughs> yeah I keep you on your toes oh yeah all right well thanks again and i'll we'll be here in about another half an hour but thanks again and we'll do this again next week all right bye all right bye